Hello, welcome to Quackalo. Thank you for being here. Today I am talking to you about the Arx errata that has existed well, for a little bit now, but it's not an obvious thing for me to search when I get a brand new Kickstarter game in. But here's the thing. This was sent to be printed officially in 2023, and it's now 2024, and they've continued doing playtesting, having people respond and ask questions and read through the rulebook and refine how the general public are receiving, understanding, and then playing or operating their game. So Leader Games has done the good thing. They've put out a little five page or four page, not four page technically, because this is just a blank piece of paper, a little four page errata with not too many major changes to the actual gameplay flow, but some very important wording choices or wording shifts that clarify the core rulebook. I know for myself, even though it should be a thing that I do, it's not common nature for me to go on to BGG and look for an errata for a game that just arrived because I assume this should be clear enough. And yeah, I'll go search for questions and try to find unanswered queries, but this really, I assume, has everything I need. And they really have done a pretty darn excellent job with the rulebook, and these player aids have been extremely handy. So I just want to walk you through the uh, FAQ here, the, the errata that we have. You can stick this on in the background and just listen to it and pop in when you're interested. I will be putting this so you can see it on camera so you can read along with me. I'm not going to read this verbatim. I'm just going to highlight the points you see. I went through with a highlighter. I'm going to highlight the points that I think are important so that you know what changes or what ways you should be interpreting the rulebook as you go through it. Uh, on top of that, I do have a few outstanding questions that my game group had, some of which has been answered by the errata, and some of which has yet to be answered by the errata. I can make assumptions on how things are played, but I would love to present these questions to you, the audience, and hopefully get some feedback and some answers from a wider group of people who are exploring reading and keeping updated with everything ARCs. The four questions that I had, and again, some of these will be answered in the errata. Can you choose where you keep tokens, or do they slide down? So let me explain. As we move cities off our board here, we have these open token slots available, and some of them are harder to steal from. They have higher levels of keys. My assumption is that I could then place tokens over here in this three key location and over here in this three key location. If I have two tokens and I have all my cities off, I can put them anywhere I want. Now, I know you can't reshuffle them, you can't reorient them until you've gained a new token, and then you can go through the whole shuffling, orienting, moving around process, but in a lot of games, the natural thing would be that all of them collapse down to the left. And that happens to be how I played my first two games. I didn't position them where it would have been most advantageous. I positioned them as I collected them, just kind of across the board. I take off my cities from the left to the right. I place my resources from the right to the left. I don't know my hands either way. You understand what I'm saying. And it's not entirely clarified. It does seem implicated. It seems implicit that I should be able to place them anywhere I want. I should have flexibility and store them in more secure lockers or less secure lockers. But I haven't seen it explicitly stated anywhere. My second question that is still unresolved. When I move my ships, I'm doing a catapult, and I'm moving through a region, a location where I have other ships, I know I can drop ships off, but I was wondering if I'm able to pick ships up. I assume I can. I understand. It's some big technological thing. I'm like drifting around the outside of the moon or the outside of the planet. I'm launching myself through. But if I move up into this location, is my next move a group of five ships? Or is my next move still the same two ships that I was already moving and I have to carry forward, dropping off and not picking up? Instinctually, I mean, based off of how root works, each one of these moves would be an individual unique move. So if I moved into this region, now my move is starting in this region and moving to another adjacent region until I enter a location that is controlled by another player or a location that is controlled or has a planet. Then my movement completely stops. So if I have one of these gates and I have some ships just waiting out there on the rim, are they able to onboard, hop onto the fleet that's spinning around the galaxy and 
spread themselves thin? Is my move initiating multiple moves? Or is my move simply starting and ending from one location with a string stretching between them? I don't know. You answer me because this doesn't quite answer it. My other question that I had that is actually answered here in the errata is can you backtrack in your moves? And this was confirmed, you absolutely can. So if I'm launching here with five ships and I wanna blast off with four of them, I can move up here into this rift. I can move over here onto two. I can drop off one ship. I can move down to three, drop off another ship, move down to four, drop off another ship, come back to three and pop in here to the planet location right next to me. I can jump into that arc. I can get into those gates and I can drop off people basically anywhere I'm able to maneuver. Now, it's not often that you have so many open spots available. I understand that. Typically players are limiting and closing those gates off pretty readily. But the fact that I can backtrack does seem to be a significant strategic shift. That also seems to indicate that I should be able to kind of pick up other ships. I don't know, we're moving, we're shifting, we're able to kind of like do a lot of flexible stuff. If I'm able to turn around the fleet that's catapulting from one location to another, why wouldn't I be able to collect ships that are over there in the outer rim? They're just spinning in the air as well. Either way, we'll continue. And the fourth question that we had from our initial plays, can you trash another player's resources? Now, I know that if I have a pile full of resources on my board and uh, I get a uh, city returned to me, and it smashes through some of my resources, I lose those resources. And I don't get to rebuild them, I don't get to reshuffle them. So if I put a resource out here in the more secure zone and a city comes back to me because someone's decided to go ahead and return their warlord chits or they have an ability that allows them to do so, I lose whatever it was that I was protecting. However, one of the things that we ran into that we're not sure that you can do is if my market is entirely full and I need to go collect more, I know I can harvest from planets, but let's say I've just got finished attacking other players. It says here in the errata that I am able to collect from a location where I can't accept or receive the resource. I still, however, will get their minion as a captive. However, if I'm stealing from them after a battle, am I able to collect their resources and reshuffle my own? Or am I able to collect their resources and just throw them away into the garbage? Or because my tableau is full, I'm unable to collect additional resources to position and maneuver around my board. It seems to indicate that on planets, you can't get the resource, or you can't hold the resource, but you can get the meeple. You can get the captive. We'll see, we'll keep going. Those are the four questions that we had after we played the things that we were hunting through, the reason why I came across the errata, and the reason why I've worked through this rulebook a second time and bookmarked areas to point out next time when we play, which will be today. It's, it's currently like 5.46 a.m. I've been up all night. I've spent, I don't know, some like 15 hours working on arcs, so this is gonna be good. Okay, so let's work through this errata. So the things that I think are important to note, one of the big things that they've added is here on page 19, you're adding the text. Uh, discard all action cards not in player's hands into the action discard pile on the map, face down. That's in the rule book. Then they added the line and shuffle the action discard pile. I don't know why this is important because after a chapter has ended and you're starting a new one, you're already gonna be shuffling the cards, dealing out six to each player and then putting them in the discard pile. You're not looking at them as far as I know. So why is it necessary to reshuffle those? I understand that the uh, order of the cards matters depending on what abilities and what things you have or what leaders and other things you're playing. But I don't quite understand why you reshuffle them. It might be tied to playing leaders who get a chance to look at the cards that weren't in play, something like that. But that clarification was added. When you put them down in the discard pile, you are reshuffling them. Then we have the setup. Setup is going to have uh, a few core changes. Uh, the two initial resources are always placed in the two leftmost resource slots, even if you have more slots open. So if you have leaders or, you, I mean, you always start with three, but if you have leaders and other people like that out here on the board, you're always going to fill the two leftmost slots. This seems to indicate that I might be able to fill other slots in other differing manners farther on in the game. 
but I don't think it's explicitly said. Simultaneous triggers. The player taking their turn chooses the order. So if we have multiple things happening on the game board, and it has some examples here, skirmish and empaths bond, repair, bone, repair drones and quartermaster, you have uh, different abilities that'll trigger depending on what's happening on the game board. As long as they're happening all at the same time, kind of like passive actions in a way, you get to choose the order that they'll be resolved in. Uh, so there's no debate as to the hierarchy of card operations. We have some clarifications around the actions. If you convert a standard action into a new action, modifiers of that standard action do not affect the new action itself. So if I have the ability assassinate, for instance, and I've converted my battle ability to the keyword assassinate, any keywords that I have that relate to battle won't relate to assassinate. So any modifiers there don't come into play. However, if the new action contains the standard, act the standard actions, modifiers do apply. So if my new action happens to be a ferocious battle or a battle then do something or do something then battle, as long as that keyword, that, that basic standard action key term is used, any modifiers I have will apply to that. So just because it's a new action, a new ability, doesn't mean uh, that everything's canceled out. But if the term has changed from battle to assassinate or something along those lines, you then will not apply battle specific modifiers. Uh, some abilities refer to when you copy or pivot to, it does not trigger from prelude actions. So if, you're, if you have an ability that's, that wants you to do certain things, your prelude actions won't be triggering those core action abilities. You need a core action to actually happen on the game in order to do that. Now, if you use a prelude action that then triggers a new action, it gets a little convoluted. You kind of understand where it's going, but preludes don't trigger abilities in and of themselves. Tax. You can tax a city even if you cannot gain a resource from it. If you tax a rival city this way, you still gain a captive. So this is where my question comes when gaining resources, stealing resources from other players or gaining resources from cities. If I tax a city where I can't get a standard resource, does that mean I cannot get a standard resource? Meaning I can't fit it on my board so I can't acquire it or it's completely out in the market. So therefore I have nothing in order, I have nothing available to pick up, which I think might be what this is indicating, but I can still get the captive. Can I, grab the resources from my opponent or grab the resources from the market if they're there, they just don't fit on my board, reshuffle my board and throw some away? I think so. It seems to be the best possible, but it's still a floating question. Move. During a catapult move, you have to stop at any planet regardless of control and a gate that is controlled by a rival. This is clarified from the text in the book, which doesn't make it as explicitly clear as I think you'd like. So the text in the book says, doo -doo -doo. if you move from a system with a loyal starport, you must, you may take a catapult move. Keep moving the ships as much as you want, dropping them off as you want until they move into any planet or gate that is controlled by anyone else. So any planet or gate, it seems to link those together. Any planet or gate that's controlled by anyone else, it's not. It's any planet or a gate that is controlled by anyone else. That keyword A there is the thing that a lot of people, including myself, even right then, miss in reading. So that's why this clarification was made. Again, though, it adds to my question. You may continue moving. Is my move action from a new location, from one of these gates, meaning I can pick up ships? I'm not sure. As long as you've not stopped, you may backtrack while dropping off ships. That's an addition to the rulebook. Doesn't specify backtracking there. It's one of the questions that we had. I'm glad it's resolved here so I can do forward and backward, up and down, the whole chaos. Whole kit and caboodle. You can collect zero dice. I don't know why I highlighted you collect zero dice. I'm gonna look back here. Uh, battle, legal. you need a legal defender, you need a legal attacker, a legal defender, and you can choose to collect no dice if you'd like. You don't have to roll. So you can be like, I'm gonna battle you because I want this ability or I want, I don't know, something that triggers from it. But I'm your friend. I'm not going to roll any dice. I'm not doing any damage to you because I like where the game state is and I want to convince you to work with me. Moving down to rewind slash undo. This is a big emphasis and they've re-emphasized it here in the errata. They're trying to let people know that this is a complex game with lots of moving parts 
and you should be able, for the sake of the table's environment, to rework your terms and reposition. So, for example, playing an action card reveals the card to other players, but the acting player does not gain new info, so it can be undone with the consent of the table. The general rule is this. As long as an action or step does not reveal new information to the acting player, it can be undone with the consent of the table. They want you to be able to rework things. They're even flexible with when you do your prelude actions can kind of merge into your core actions of the game as long as you haven't revealed things along the way. There's sort of a bunch of like a wiggliness there because there's a lot of moving parts. They don't want you to get bogged down in the nuanced detail. They're telling people who are rules lawyers like Mr. Ma Michael Matthews or my lovely wife Shira this because people who are way more flexible uh, and want to fudge the rules every now and then when they're explicitly written. Uh, we always try to do stuff like this. There are some things that reveal information, though. For instance, battle, rolling dice, securing, revealing a new card on the, on the deck, uh, declaring ambition, so going ahead and claiming something with farseers or using the other card from a player's hand, uh, mulliga mulliganing a hand in a two-player game, so wiping out your cards and drawing a new set. Any new information, of course, prevents you from ever going backwards. Turn structure. Here's the turn structure. Play an action card. If you're leading, declare an ambition. If you're not leading, you can seize the initiative. After that, prelude window begins. Prelude window ends when you've done any, or before you've done any actions, but when you're about to. And at that point, you return all of the resources you've spent, meaning they were just not available until after your prelude action. Then you can play action tips from your cards. In practice, as long as your actions do not reveal new information, it's fine to rewind your prelude. Again, highlighting the flexibility that they want you to have with when and how you take actions throughout the course of the game. Some other clarifications. You cannot use prelude actions on cards that you secure from the court in the same prelude. However, you can use non-prelude parts of the cards. Mining interests manufacture action later in the same turn. So. I can't take a prelude ability and utilize it in the same prelude phase. However, if the card that I'm taking has other actions and other abilities, like a new action modifier, I can then use that in the action phase after my prelude phase has closed. So there's a little bit of nuance there in when and how you can use abilities from cards that you just received from the market. Surpass with a seven. This is only in a four player game. Surpassing with a seven seizes the initiative unless it was already seized. If someone's already claimed it, or you're pretty sure there's sevens out there and you need the initiative, on that first turn, play a card down, play a second one, grab it, get it. You want to set whatever this is. You know someone's going to be stealing it from you. Whatever you have to do early on, grab that initiative, because once it's been seized for the first time, nothing can be done to take it again. It's a really important part to play. I don't think we utilize it much in our first two games. I'm looking forward to paying more attention to it as we continue exploring arcs. Moving on down, resources. In your prelude, you can always spend resources without effect, regardless of your outrage. I don't understand this at all, and I need a lot of clarification because the errata here confuses me. I go to page, uh, I go to page 16 here. Let's see what page 16 has to say. I see it right here. You cannot spend outrage resources for their normal prelude action. So here in your prelude, you can always spend resources without effect, regardless of your out. I think it just clicked what they're talking about. If I have resources and I just want to get rid of them, I can always discard them. I can always just get them off my board. I don't know why you'd want to do that because I can't use them for a standard action if I have outrage. But despite having outrage, you can dispel of them. But why would you want to do that if you can always collect resources from planets as long as they're available and bring them back onto your board? Maybe because you have a card like uh, there's, a, there's a card that allows you to do things like uh, gain you know, all of the food resources available. So maybe because you want to open up slots, but then I would I would play that card. I, I guess I need open slots to do that. So I would discard some of these, play that card, grab the food and fill up my board. 
I guess that's a spot. So you can kind of always discard in your prelude. You can always get rid of, even if your outrage doesn't allow you to use it as a standard action, you can always just expel it. That makes sense. Good. Okay. I'm glad you helped me clarify that. I'm still working through these myself. Moving on down. You can rearrange resources in your resource slots when you gain a resource. You cannot rearrange resources when a resource is removed, meaning when you spend one, when you discard one, when one is stolen, you can't rearrange them then, which makes me think if I'm spending here and spending here, suddenly the position of my board is open, it's split. So that seems to indicate that I should be able to collect and rearrange and put them kind of wherever I want. I'm leaning towards that answer. Finally, destroying a city. As a result, as a result, the outrage step one does not discard cards you gain from steps two and three. So the order of destroying a city, provoke outrage, put the mark down, destroying everything from your board, getting rid of resources, getting rid of icons that are related to the type of planet you destroyed, ransack the court, stealing a card from the court, then spend keys to steal from other players if you roll a raid card. Here's where this is cool. I could have destroyed all of the, you know, scion or relic resources on my own tableau, but then acquired and stolen from another player those same scion and relic resources. And just because we went outraged doesn't mean I have to remove those from my board. It doesn't affect things that you get after you've already outraged your board. So good way to do some positioning and shuffling or if you accidentally destroy a city, which can certainly happen with an aggressive dice roll, because you gotta apply those, you gotta apply that damage. If you accidentally destroy a city that you're not intending to destroy, all hope is not lost. Just steal things from other players around the table. There you have it. That's a breakdown of the errata, the stuff that they've clarified, some of the rules that we're still confused on. I think I have a good sense of how they work. My instinct says for this first one that I uh, can choose where I keep tokens on my board. Whenever I gain a new token, I can rearrange them and position them however I would like even if there's open spaces. My instinct says I can move and because I'm continuing to do multiple move actions, I can pick up ships from the gates. That one, though I'm not confident on at all. Uh, my resources, my, my instinct, because the rules literally say this, the errata literally says this, is I can backtrack. And then my instinct says that I can take resources from another player, even if they can't fit on my board, they'll just reshuffle and I'll discard something, whether it's that resource that I took or something else from my own tableau. So I'm not limited from acquiring, I'm just limited from keeping and using. There you have it. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Let me know. Any other questions that you still have around ARCs? I mean, we haven't even jumped into the leaders and the lore, so this is just base game that we're exploring. They're still working on the errata for leaders, lore, and the expansion. So keep your eyes, ears, and uh, hearts on the table. Whatever the case though, whatever you do, remember to do the important thing, always check. For brand new Kickstarter games that went to print over a year, year and a half ago, what rules they've uh, missed and changed between the time you get your official rulebook and the time they started, uh, well, sending it for playtesting and prototyping. We'll see you next time. Bye.